And last week, we began this series called The City, and we're talking about how God wants to love our city, and how God wants to bless our city, and how God wants to use us to be a catalyst for change in the communities, in the cities that God has placed us in. And one of the things that we've talked about is for a lot of us who grew up in the church, we have heard a lot about loving God. We've heard a lot about our personal relationship with God, how God loves us, how we're called to love God, how we're supposed to spend a lot of time in devotion with God. But maybe we haven't heard a lot about the other side, about how we're called to love people. And what we want to do for the next few weeks is talk about what it looks like for us to love people, what it looks like for us to love our neighbors, what it looks like for us to love our city. We mentioned that we have to begin with the idea that this is God's desire, that God loves this city, that his posture toward people, his posture toward us is not of judgment and hate, but it is toward love and mercy and grace. That's his posture toward the city. And because you and I are created in the image of God, we are called to reflect and mimic God to society. And therefore, our posture toward people is to be one of love and one of mercy and one of grace. Because he loves our city, therefore, we are to love our city. And so last week, we began to talk about what it looks like for God to love our city. When we talked about the idea of blessing, and if you remember, we took that word blessing and we said the root meaning of that word blessing is to bend the knee, to serve. When God blesses a city and when God blesses us, he's giving us what we need most. He bends the knee and he serves us. He gives us what is best for us. We talked about the tangible ways that he blesses us, the gifts that we have, the possessions that we have, the things that we own, our jobs, our families. Those are things that we call a blessing from God. But there's also something intangible about it. There's more to God's blessing than the things that we receive. See, what God wants to give us most is himself. And so when he bends down the knee, when he stoops down, what he gives us is himself. He gives us Jesus. He gives us his very presence in our lives. So the greatest blessing that we ever have is Jesus. He's our greatest need. He's our greatest desire. And God gives us himself. See, if we're going to love the city the way that God loves the city, if we're going to bless our city, if we're going to bend the knee and serve the city, then what that means is we have to give the city what it needs best. We have to be rather holistic in how we love and bless the people around us. And when I talk about the city, let me break that down a little bit. I'm going to talk about loving your neighbor. And Jesus' definition of loving your neighbor is the people that are closest to you, the people that are around you, the people that are in, that God has put you near. So for some of you, that will be family members that don't know Jesus. How do you love them? How do you bless them? How do you point them toward Jesus? For others of you, it'll be coworkers or um, people in your school or people in your neighborhood. How do you point them toward Jesus? These are the people that we are supposed to bless in tangible, holistic ways, but at the heart of it all is this big, massive blessing that we want to love people by giving them God. We want them to know that there is a God who exists And we want them to know that this God loves them. So the question we've got to ask this morning as we begin this morning is, do you live that way? Take inventory of your life and is this the way you live? I'm not talking so much about the loving God part as much as the loving others part. Do you find yourself when you look at your life that you love people and you want to bless people? Some of you do a great job at this. You are phenomenal in working with other people. You love to give. You love to serve. You love to bless. You love to be around other people. Can I challenge you to take a step back and even look at your own motives and why you do that? Are you doing this because you're in love with God and because you want other people to experience and love God as well? Or are you doing it because um, you're trying to get something from God or you're trying to get something from other people? Are you loving God because 
you love God and you do the things that God wants you to do, that if you do the right things, maybe God will love you more and your motivation is trying to get something from God? Or do you love people because you realize that if you love people and you treat people nicely, that maybe you'll get something out of other people? So what's your motive? Why do you love people? Why do you love God? Beyond just your motive, what's your message? At the end of the day, there are a lot of good people that do a lot of good things in this world. You don't have to be a follower of Jesus to do good things, do you? I mean, when you think about this idea of loving people, what are you trying to communicate to those people that you're trying to bless? Are you simply doing good deeds Or are you communicating that ultimately the hope that we have in this world is in belonging to Jesus and being a part of his family? When you think about what you do in loving people and what you say in loving people, is your message that is being communicated through your work and through your words that can be explained apart from the work of Jesus? Is it just good stuff that anybody can do? Or is it inexplicable apart from the love, the grace, the mercy, the goodness, the kindness, and the power of Jesus in your life? What is coming out of you? What's your message? For those of you who think about your lives and you see that you aren't doing a really good job at this, maybe you know that this is true in Scripture. Maybe you know that God is calling us to love people and love our neighbors. But for some reason or another, you're here this morning and your heart isn't stirred by it. You don't get excited by caring for other people. For some of you, this is something your heart is stirred by, but you screw up when you're around other people, right? You you make a mess of yourself when you're around other people. You stumble, you say the wrong things, you you want to do it, but you don't do a good job at it. And so where are you this morning? Where are you in the journey of listening to God, hearing God's voice, and blessing the people around you? And we talked last week about this idea of bless. We took that word bless and we turned it into an acronym about how we want to bless our city. And we said the word B is to begin with prayer. Ask God, God, who are you calling me to love? Who are you calling me to be engaged in? Who are you calling me to pray for? Who are you calling me to serve? Who are you calling me to minister to? Ask God, because God will reveal to you who he wants you to touch and who he wants you to impact. B, begin with prayer. L, listen. In order for you to listen to someone, you got to be able to start a conversation. you got to talk to them. you got to hear what's going on in their lives. Begin with prayer, but then go and get involved in their lives. Ask them how they're doing. How's their family? What's going on in their lives? Listen to them. Listen to areas where you can start praying for them. Listen to God talk, maybe where you can interject God into the conversation and see if they have any interest in God at all. B, begin with prayer. L, listen. E, eat. We do good at that. We love to eat. But what if we took our eating and use that to bring glory and honor to God. You know, the greatest conversations that Jesus had in the Bible were all around a table. The Lord's Supper that we celebrate was while he was eating a meal. Conversations that he had was all sitting in front of other people. There's something sacred about sitting in front of someone, sharing a meal, and talking to them. Eat. Maybe for some of you that maybe don't have the finances, maybe that's just taking them and grabbing a Happy Meal. Maybe it's a coffee. Maybe it's inviting them to your house, but sharing a meal and eating with them and hearing their story. S, serve. So as you hear their story and you hear, you find ways you minister to them. And then how do you serve them? You can serve them by simply praying for them. You can serve them by hearing one of their tangible needs and saying, you know what, I'd love to help you with that. I'd love to be involved in your life. I'd love to um, bless you in a certain manner. And then the final S is story. We can do all of the first four, but if it never points them back to Jesus, it's pointless. So how do you share your story of what God has done in your life and then bring the story of God into their story. And this is what we're called to do. We're called to bless. 
So maybe you're here this morning and you've hit a wall. Maybe you feel like, man, I don't know how to bless people. I'm tired. I've got a lot on my plate and life is stressful. And the last thing that's on your mind is how do I love people? Maybe you're stuck. You don't know what it's like given all of the situations and the circumstances of your life. And you don't know what it's like to love someone. And during this series, we want to help you with that. It's going to be a very practical series for you. Maybe it comes down simply to the fact that you don't want to love someone. You don't want to love people. You've got too much on your your plate. The only thing you care about right now is yourself. And let's be honest, there might be some of us in this room. That's where we're at. It's you and God, and that's it. See, What I know about hitting walls is that whenever you hit a wall, it hurts. It's painful. Um, Things break. So maybe you find yourself this morning hitting a wall. It's not a neutral position. Whether something has happened to you or you are doing something that's causing you to crash into a wall, now you find yourself broken. And here's the good news. Last week was telling us that God loves our city by blessing our city. The question that we're addressing this morning is, who does God use to bless our city? What kind of person is God going to use to love and bless our city? And the answer is this. God uses broken people to love our city. God uses broken people to bless our city. And we're going to get that from the psalm that we're going to read this morning. Let me give you a little bit of the backstory for this psalm, then I'll read it, and then what we'll do is we'll unpack it for a little bit. My Bible is the English Standard Version, and in my Bible, there's an intro to Psalm 51, and it says this. It says, this is a psalm of David after Nathan had gone to him, after David had gone to Bathsheba. Here's the story. David was the king of Israel. He was the most powerful man. He had have anything he wanted. The Bible says he was a man after God's own heart, meaning God looks at him and says, this guy understands what I'm about. But then David opens himself up to evil. He commits adultery. He has an affair with a married woman. And then she gets pregnant. And to cover his sin, he murders her husband. So... To understand where we are in this story, let me ask you a question. I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. How many of you in this room have ever told a lie? Okay, those of you who aren't raising your hands, you, know, you do realize you're lying in church right now, right? Um, most all of us have. We all probably told a lie. Now, if I were to ask you, and please don't raise your hands, how many of you have ever committed adultery or slept with someone that wasn't your spouse or murdered, chances are most of us in this room probably are not going to raise our hands, right? The point is all sin is equal in God's eyes. But if you have sinned in your life and created a hole in your life, your hole is probably like a small pothole compared to the sinkhole that David has created for his life. Adultery, murder, His life is a mess. These aren't small things that we're dealing with. But it's here in the midst of that that David begins to experience the love of God. Because when David's sin is exposed, he begins to experience once again the love of God for him. Because God loves David, when David tries to hide his sin, God's going to drag it out into the open. And because God loves David, when that sin is dragged out into the open, God is going to hide it and bury it from God himself. This is what we see going on in Psalm 51. Read it with me. It should be behind me. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me 
and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right off sacrifices and burnt offerings and the whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. This is the classic chapter on repentance. And let me define repentance for you. By the way, if you are wanting to follow along on the notes, if you have a phone, you can look on notes.loftcitychurch.com or if you have our app, it's on there as well. But they have some of the definitions there for you as well. But repentance. In basic everyday language, repentance is owning up to what you and I have done and who, what you and I are in light of what God is, who God is, and what God has done. You and I owning up to who we are and what we have done in light of who God is and what God has done. That's repentance. You and I owning up to it, seeing it, realizing who we are, what we've done in light of who God is and what God has done. When David repents in this text, he owns up to who he is and what he's done. What he's going to say is, I'm a sinner. When you look at verse 1 of Psalm 51, David is going to use three words to describe his sinfulness, transgression, iniquity, and sin. What's sin? The Bible defines sin in multiple ways, but here's one that I would encourage you to remember because I think it makes the most sense. It would help us to consider some of the things that are going on in the world and whether they are sinful or not. I would define sin basically as us trying to play God. Us trying to be our own savior. Us trying to be our own king. Us trying to make our own rules. Us trying to solve our own problems. That's sin. Us trying to be God. Our desire is not to allow God to be God, not to allow him to define the rules, not to allow him to solve our problems. And when we try to do it on our own, that's the essence of what sin is. David says, this is who I am. I'm a sinner. I'm trying to play God. I'm going to make my own rules. I'm going to go commit adultery with a woman that I shouldn't be sleeping with. And then I'm going to try to solve my own problems. I'm going to try to get rid of her husband so that no one will know. Owning up to what he's done. He says, I'm a sinner. And then he talks about who he is and he says, I'm evil. Verse 4, he is brutally honest with himself. And let me be clear, by God's grace, me and you, we are called to be brutally honest about ourselves. In verse 4, David says, against you and you only have I sinned. And that's a remarkable statement if you think about it. Especially if you're related to the guy who was murdered. Against you, God. Against you only have I sinned. I've only done evil in your sight. David doesn't say, oops. He doesn't say, oh, I made a mistake. He doesn't say, I need to fix myself. He's going to call himself what he is, evil. See, but it's in that place, it's in that place of self-understanding that we begin to understand the love of God for us. Because here is this man saying, I'm evil I don't deserve the love of God, but he is repenting of who he is and what he's done in light of who God is and what God has done. David's not simply saying, I'm not holy, I'm not perfect. God is. He's going to press the weight of his own hope into the character of God that we find in verse 1. And in verse 1, here's what David says about God. That God is a God of mercy, that God is a God of steadfast love, and that God is a God of abundant compassion. This is the God that David encounters in the midst of his evil. 
in the midst of his wickedness, in the midst of his desire to play God. This is the God that David encounters. This is David repenting. He is owning up to who he is and what he's done. One thing that's important for us to see in this passage is that David is going to do this from the right perspective. He's not repenting in order to earn God's love. For example, some of us, when we have communion, we'll sit there and we'll repent and we'll say, God, forgive me, forgive me of all the things that I've done. And you'll try to make yourself feel awful for the things you've done and prove to God that you're really repentant and really sorry. But David doesn't do that in this text. You don't see begging from David here. There's nobility, there's honor. He is heartbroken, but he isn't trying to prove to God how sorry he is. He isn't even making it about the consequences of his sin. And David had some major consequences because of this sin. He was outed publicly. When Nathan shows up and says, David, you've sinned? He didn't, it wasn't a private conversation that no one else heard. Everyone knew about it. The whole nation knew that David sinned. And from that point on in David's life, his power and influence was diminished. In fact, his own family members began to turn against him. David and Bathsheba have a son. That son dies. But nowhere in Psalm 51 do you see David talking about him losing his power and influence. Nowhere in Psalm 51 do you see David talking about the son that he lost. David's not sitting here trying to make promises that he'll do better. Oh God, if you will just forgive me this one thousand more times, then I'll never sin again. God, I will never mess up again if you'll forgive me this time. That's not what he's doing here at all. You never see that in this text. See, the reason he doesn't repent in order to earn something from God is because he already knows that God loves him. Because it was because God loved him, God exposed his sin. David is presumptuous in our text. And you can take the phrase, because God loves me, and you can put it in front of verse 1. Because God, you love me, have mercy on me. Because God, you love me, according to your steadfast love. Because God, you love me, give me compassion. David is presuming on the love of God. Here's why me and you, we need this text. We need this text because we're evil people. We're nice people. You guys are nice. But we're nice, evil people. We're here. We're hanging out. We're nice to each other. We like each other. But we're evil. Which is ultimately the reason why we come to God. We need this text because this is the greatest news in the universe. That wicked, evil people can be real with God and in being real with God about their wickedness, they discover the reality of a God toward them. The reality of God toward evil and wicked and undeserving people, according to this psalm, is that God is a God of love, of mercy, and compassion. We need this psalm because... We're banking everything on God's love to undeserving people. Because if this isn't true, if God doesn't love undeserving people, guys, we're screwed. We are. Nothing matters in life at that point if God doesn't love undeserving people. But if it is true, and God does love undeserving people, can I tell you, it doesn't matter how deep the darkness is in your soul, how pervasive the evil is in your soul and in your life, I'm telling you that sin does not have the last word. Your habitual pattern of sin in your life doesn't have the last word. It's real, it's there, but it doesn't own you. It doesn't define you. It doesn't have to because God loves you even though you're undeserving. We need this text because this text shows us Jesus. Do you know the people in the New Testament that hated Jesus were the people that thought they had their life all together? They were the people that they thought they thought they deserved the blessing of God because they were good people and they did the right things and they felt threatened by the real Jesus because Jesus was coming and saying, I'm going to offer mercy and compassion and love to people that don't deserve it. 
Listen, you don't need mercy. You don't need compassion. You don't need love if you have your life all together. But the people that came to Jesus were broken. They were needy. They were guilty. They messed up their lives. People who thought their lives were awful. People that have felt their lives were terrible. They've done horrible things. These were the type of people that were drawn to Jesus. They thought there was no way that God could love them until they met Jesus. And that changed everything for them. We need this text because it shows us the people that God uses to love our city, to love our neighbor, are broken people. People like you, people like me, who don't have our act together, but we're trusting that we have a God of love, of mercy, of compassion. Look at verse 17. If this psalm is the psalm of repentance, verse 17 is the heartbeat of the entire text. In the first 16 verses, David is talking about himself. He's personal. And then in verse 17, we begin to understand the principle behind this. And in that verse, verse 17, David says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. You will not despise, God. It's a reminder that God in his posture toward the broken, the guilty, and the needy. The scripture says that God loves those who are brokenhearted. Listen, that's not just people that are having a bad day or someone said something mean to you. That includes people who have broken themselves. He is near to the brokenhearted. He saves those who have crushed themselves under the folly of trying to be their own God. Listen, let's talk a moment about why you and I are here this morning. I'm not just simply saying why, you're, why we're here physically, but my guess is you didn't walk in here this morning because you just wanted to go through the motions. Let me be honest. If you did that, that's kind of silly because Christianity is not a very good hobby, especially on a Sunday morning when you could be sleeping in. My guess is you walked in here and you want to be honest. You don't want to make yourself better than you really are. You want to be able to put all the cards on the table in front of God. But you might not believe that's possible because you don't believe this is a safe place. So I need you to understand that God created the church. The reason that we gathered is so that you might know that the church is a safe place for undeserving people to find love, mercy, mercy, compassion. That's what the church is about. We're not perfect people. We're people who rely on the love, the mercy, and compassion of Jesus. Yes, God intends for you to live the life where you love people around you. And no, we haven't done that perfectly. And yes, he intends for you to grow into that kind of life. He intends for you to love other people. But listen, God's not going to scold you or shame you or guilt you or force you into loving other people. That's not the type of God we serve. Some of you think that's the way that God works. God's going to yell at you or God's going to punish you or God's going to force you to get your act together. God's going to make you feel bad. God will expose you as an unloving person. And then you'll try harder to love other people. God doesn't work that way. He doesn't scold you or shame you into loving other people. He actually loves you into loving other people. He shows you grace. He shows you love. He shows you mercy so much that it overflows out of your life into how you love other people. So I constantly have conversations with people people that care about holiness. And listen, holiness is huge, it's important. And this is what I'll hear. They'll say, I hear you talking about the grace of God all the time and the love of God all the time and the mercy of God all the time, but, let me give you a general principle. Whenever we talk about the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God and you throw a but in there, you're veering off, off course. Because we think the problem is that we think that if we keep telling people that God loves them, the people are going to take advantage of that. And you know what? The scripture says that's exactly right. That's exactly true. If you keep talking about the love of God, 
people are going to take advantage of that because that's the only way that you and I know how to live. That's the only way that we live, taking advantage of God's love. There is no person in this room that has all of their stuff together that don't take advantage of the love, the mercy, the grace, and the compassion of God. All of us do on a daily basis. What's amazing is that God doesn't change the equation. That God doesn't say, you know what, you're taking advantage of me. I'm going to change the rules a little bit. You can only take advantage of me six times or seven times, and then you're screwed. God doesn't do that at all. God wants you to take advantage of his love. God wants you to take advantage of his compassion. God wants you to take advantage of his mercy. And God wants you to lean on him and trust him and say, God, help me, and watch him change you from the inside out. So you want to be a more loving person? You think that's going to happen because you got your act together? Because you get your life more organized and you think differently about certain things because you change some behaviors in your life? No. It's going to be the love, the mercy, the grace, the compassion of Jesus in your life that changes you and changes how you live. Here's how I know that. Look at verse 18 and 19. If you look at verse 18 and 19, it feels like it doesn't fit in the psalm at all. Because the first 17 verses is all about repentance and forgiveness. And all of a sudden, in verse 18, it changes course. But here in these two verses, we find where the blessing comes. What we're encountering in verse 18 is the description of a life that's countercultural to the world that we live in and a description of a God that we would never imagine creating on our own. Here's why these two verses are in this psalm. Because while repentance is going to break us, it's never going to paralyze us. David says, do good in Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. What he's talking about here, there's a God that's calling you to personal repentance, to own up to who you are and what you've done in light of who God is and what God's done. He's calling you to do that today, but then he intends to use your repentance and your posture of saying, God, help to bless the city. The language here is about Zion and Jerusalem and the city of God. Here's a world full of undeserving people, evil, wicked people like you and I. And here's this new world crashing in, ruled by a God of love, of compassion, of mercy. Love, compassion, and mercy to undeserving people. And God says, this is the way that life is supposed to be experienced. Here's the reality. When you and I sin... It doesn't just affect yourself. It affects your family. It affects your friends. It affects your church. The biggest problem about your sin isn't the consequences of your sin. It's the story that it communicates about God. You are telling the world something about God and the universe, what he's like, whether he exists, whether he loves people, and when you sin, when you are trying to play God, you are going to mess all of that up and you're not going to let people see God. They're going to see something else. When you sin, people don't see God. The kingdom isn't advanced. God's name is not made famous. But on the flip side of that, when you repent, people see God. When you beg for mercy and grace and compassion when the posture of your life is God I don't deserve this but you have forgiven me and you have given me grace and love and mercy what the world sees is there's a God who is loving merciful compassionate to undeserving people like them see if we're the moral people if we're the people that do great at all the Christian stuff then the world doesn't know what to make of us and we have very little to say to them. But if we, like them, understand that we are undeserving of the love of God, undeserving of the mercy of God, undeserving of the compassion of God, but he gives it to us, then maybe they might believe that he will give it to them as well. So if you're here and you feel like you're a mess and you're broken and nothing is going right and you're terrible at being a Christian, you feel like you're a hypocrite, if you're here and you're broken and guilty and needy, you are exactly the kind of person that God loves. 
You're the kind of person that God loves. You're the, exactly the kind of person that God will use to bless this city, and you're the kind of person that God will use to love our city. Because your life, if it has this posture of repentance, communicates to the world, there is a God that will love them even though they don't deserve it. See, and when we think about what it means for us as a church, as we try to love our city and wanting our city to know Jesus, our mission as a church is to convince our city that Jesus cannot be ignored. We want to make Jesus not ignorable. Can I tell you what can't be ignored? Mercy can't be ignored. Love cannot be ignored. Compassion cannot be ignored. And you're sitting there and you're thinking, wait a minute, God is loving, merciful, compassionate all the time. Yet we ignore him. I ignore him. Can I suggest that this is one of the reasons that God will allow you to be broken on his watch? God, the good God, will sometimes not stop you from you trying to play God. He will allow you to go and try to make your own rules. He doesn't stop you from that. He doesn't try to stop you from solving your own problems. He could. He's all-powerful. He could do anything he wants. He could do whatever he wants to do, but he doesn't stop you from the folly and wickedness of you trying to play God, you trying to make your own rules, and you trying to solve your own problems. And the reason he does that is because he loves you. God loves you by breaking you. The reason that God doesn't keep you from your wickedness and your folly and foolishness is because if we were ever free from sin in the way that which we are currently created, we would never believe that God would love us and we would never be dependent on God. We think we'd have our act together on our own. So God allows us to break ourselves because in our breaking, we run and we are dependent on God. Listen, my wife has seen me at my worst and my worst has not been pretty. When she looks at me now 10 years into our marriage and she says she loves me, that is a lot more real today than it was 10 years ago when we were making our vows because she's seen me at my worst and she still says she loves me. God loves undeserving people. He's not reserving his love for perfect people. He's not reserving his love for you when you get your act together. He's not reserving his love for you for the you that you hope to be one day. He loves you now in your wickedness, in your evil, in your sin, as you try to make your own rules and solve your own problems. See, this is the great news. He loves you in your brokenness, and in your brokenness, he uses you to love a broken city. The reason you and I can love a broken city as broken people is because we have a God who broke himself for us. So when we get up in a few moments and we do communion and we talk about how the body of Christ was broken for us, Our great hope is not that we somehow stay in our brokenness. Our brokenness should grieve us. It should break us. It should cause us to run to Jesus and beg for his help and his mercy and his grace for him to transform us. But we don't have to hide it. We don't have to lie about it. We can be open and we can be honest. We can own up to it. We can repent Because a broken person like you and me is loved by a God who was broken for us. So when Jesus gives, gives this meal to his closest friends at the Last Supper, and when he gives it to us today, he says, you've got to decide whether you're going to be your own God or whether I'm going to be God. Listen, for those of us who are, aren't followers of Jesus in this room, and maybe you're not, Can I be brutally honest with you? And I say this out of love. You are in a heap of trouble. There is a real love of God. You are alive this morning. You're breathing this morning. You're here this morning listening to these words. 
God loves you enough to clearly communicate to you that he loves you, that you don't deserve his love, but he gives it to you anyway. And listen, you are in a room of undeserving people, and the only difference between you and a follower of Jesus is that maybe you're more moral than a follower of Jesus. You care about how well you perform than a follower of Jesus does. But can I tell you, it's not about your performance. It's not about their performance. It is about the performance of one who gave his life for us. It's about Jesus. It's about how he was broken for us so that now we can be honest about our brokenness and out of our brokenness, we can love a broken city.